Hello again. Now time for a session by Nishit Agarwal. Nishit leads the Hudi project at Huber and is a main contributor on Apache Hudi project. Um, he's also a blogger uh, and he will tell us about building large scale transactional data lakes using Apache Hudi. Nishit, it's your turn. All right, thank you, Aline. Um, so I'll just start over again. Uh, yeah, welcome, folks. My name is uh, Nishit Agarwal. Um, and um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about building large scale transactional data lakes with Apache Hudi. So a little bit about me. I work as a, a Apache Hudi PMT um, and uh, have some happy news to share with you. Uh, Hudi recently graduated to an Apache top level project. Um, I also work as an engineering manager at Uber, largely working on problems in the data world, such as standardized ingestion, uh, schematization, data latency, and sort of defining primitives uh, on a data lake. Um, I have a couple of links here for other relevant blogs that may be uh, you know, in, uh, useful in the context of this presentation. All right, so let's dive into it. So what is a data lake? Um, so a data lake is a centralized repository that allows you to store your structured as well as unstructured data at scale. Um, so the idea is to store data as is uh, without having to first uh, you know, run structuring on that data um, so that you can run different types of uh, you know, workloads on it, uh, analytics, dashboards, visualizations, uh, and other big data processing to make better uh, decisions. Um, so let's look at some of the requirements uh, from a data lake. Uh, so the first requirement I want to talk about is uh, incremental database ingestion. Um, so you know, think about you know some uh, you know upstream database that you might have, uh, which you are using for uh, business critical functions, uh, and you're performing a bunch of inserts, updates, and deletes, uh, you know, to that table to uh, you know to maintain your business um, use cases, um, and then you want this represented in your data lake. Um, so uh, this this the data that's that's contained in the in these kinds of tables are usually high value data. Maybe user information, maybe other transactional information, um, and uh, you know one of the ways used to like uh, uh, have this data represented onto the data lake is by bulk loading, uh, you know, these tables onto the data lake. Um, some of the problems uh, that plague this approach are, you know, bulk loads don't scale; they add more load to the database, uh, and at the same time, they uh, involve a lot of wasteful rewriting of data, depending on how you how much of data you are bulk loading. Um, the second requirement I want to talk about is, uh, you know, deduping log events. Um, so uh, think about a bunch of, uh, you know, impression events that may have been produced by your web application or your mobile application, and you want to replicate this onto your data lake. Uh, uh, and at the end of the day, you don't want any duplicates on the data lake. Um, so it could be a message, something like which has an event ID, some dates, date, date and time, uh, you know, values, and uh, a bunch of information about the impression. Um, so this kind of data is generally like really high scale time series data, uh, you know, order of several billions or even a trillion trillions of messages per day nowadays, um, and uh, you know, of the order of uh, a few millions per second. Um, and some of the causes for these duplicates could be, you know, retries on the client, uh, you know, failures on the network, as well as data pipelines that may be ingesting this, which are at least once only. Um, so the problems that happen with uh, you know duplicates are so, uh, you know problems such as overcounting. So say you're uh, you know evaluating uh, these metrics to drive some business metric. Um, those these more impressions uh, lead to low fidelity data. Uh, third requirement is around storage management. Uh, you know when we developed Hudi, it was initially developed for HDFS, and uh, you know one of the notorious things about HDFS is it does not like a lot of small files given some of the limitations of uh, how the metadata is handled in the name node. Um, but at the same time, you know, Hoodie, Hoodie runs on other cloud stores as well. But like, you know, small files in general are a problem because they they end up controlling, you know, how how fast or slow your queries can run, or you know, you're stressing some of the file system metadata anyways. Um, um, and so the uh, the other solution could be to write big files. Uh, but the problem is writing big files involves waiting for these files to be written. So for example, if you're writing a two GB parquet file. It could take between five to ten minutes, depending on the complexity of your schema. Um, so uh, the solution could be: okay, we write small files, but we want to convert them into big files. Um, so can we do file stitching? Um, you know, well, the problem with file stitching is: okay, it's non-standardized. Um, you know, how do we get consistency of all applications to do file stitching? Um, and even if you do file stitching, you know, queries, uh, the small files are anyways exposed to these exposed to the small uh, to the uh, to the to the query engines. And so you anyway see some sort of like query degradation. 
Um, the fourth and the uh, fourth and important requirement is transactional rights. Um, uh, the idea is to bit, bring asset semantics to the data lake. So as in uh, when you know we ingest more and more change data capture and late arriving events, um, and at the same time we want to have content readers and writers. How do we support uh, asset semantics on the data lake? Um, so in the context of the data lake, um, like let me just define asset. So A stands for uh, atomicity, which is essentially the publishing of data. Um, so say you're ingesting a data and the data fails midway, um, we should basically either show things that have been atomically published or things that are have not been and, and not show things that have not been atomically published. Um, consistency is about you know only the valid data is saved, so anything that's invalid is is rolled back and not exposed uh, to the users. Um, snapshot so isolation is essentially like okay we have read committed data and at the same time we have confident writers and readers. How do we provide isolation uh, of uh, you know read committed data from uh, from these concurrent operations? And finally, uh, durability we do not want any data loss on our data lake. Uh, the fifth requirement is around faster derived ETL data. So um, now so now, now think about you know you have these unstructured data that you've uh, ingested onto your data lake, and you essentially want to perform some derived uh, analysis on these uh, uh, on this data. For example, you have a raw payments table. Um, in, a, in a raw table, and you want to standardize these payments across, let's say, multiple cities uh, and multiple countries, and you want to develop a derived table on, on top of that. Um, so these these kinds of pipelines generally involve like multiple stage ETLs, uh, you know, very common in batch analytics, and reads a fairly large amount of data. And one of the you know problems with uh, you know working with derived data sets is how do you keep them fresh as your upstream data is changing? Um, and uh, you know how do you scale them as you want to do recomputations and window joints? Um, and then finally, I think uh, you know one of the another very uh, upcoming requirements from a data lake is how do we handle data deletions and uh, you know compliance? Uh, you know, in the recent days, uh, there are a lot of like requirements from like you know following strict rules on data retention or having to delete records, correct data, uh, and and you want to do this across all your data sets on on the data lake. Um, so you essentially want an efficient way to be able to delete this data, which involves maybe like a pointish lookup on index, but uh, on on the data. But at the same time, you still want app optimized uh, scans on this data because that's the bulk of the use cases uh, that are running on these data lakes. Um, and finally, we want to propagate uh, you know these uh, deleted records downstream uh, to other uh, you know uh, derived tables. So recapping all these requirements, um, you know, uh, we need incremental database ingestion, uh, you know, for uh, you know fresh data, avoiding re uh, rewrites of large amounts of data. Uh, we want to be able to like dedupe log events uh, and at the same time do storage management to make sure that as our log events scale, uh, we also uh, scale our um, you know the, the file, the distributed file system that we use. Um, and then we want transactional rights along with faster derived ETL for uh, you know improved and faster. Uh, you know, warehousing, um, and then we want compliance and some unique key constraints to handle late arriving data. For example, let's say deletes and data corrections. So at this point, uh, let me introduce Apache Hoodie. Um, uh, so Hoodie stands for Hadoop Upserts and Incrementals. Um, so think of a bunch of Kafka streams database change logs that you can ingest onto a Hoodie table, um, and at the same time, you can also uh, ingest, uh, you know, on chain uh, Hoodie upstream tables. Into downstream and other uh, other hoodie tables, um, and all of this data is available in different forms. Uh, you could use query engines such as Hive and Spark for incremental data pipelines, or you could use Spark and Presto for interactive queries. Um, and uh, hoodie exposes different types of queries to be able to uh, you know meet different use cases. And all of this data is can be stored in like any cloud store or HDFS, uh, basically any data distributed file system compatible storage. All right, so um, so Hoodie supports like two different table types, and I quickly wanted to get into the details of this to give you so, sort of an idea, you know, where things are going. Um, so the first uh, table type that Hoodie supports is copy on write. Um, so uh, think of a bunch of data, a batch of data that you're actually wanting to ingest into a Hoodie managed table, um, and you know Hoodie will say, okay, you know, I want to write these data into two different files based on some sort of file sizing that you may have defined. Uh, Hoodie manages all of uh, these operations on a timeline, and so Hoodie starts a uh, intends uh, and shows an intent of this operation by opening a commit and saying that this commit is implied. 
Finally, when the data is actually written, uh, this commit is atomically published, and these versions of files are available to be queried. And I say this as a read-optimized query because you know these are like just pure parquet files. Um, so this, these, uh, so copy and write could be looked at as a drop-in replacement for your, uh, you know, uh, canonical parquet tables in Hive. Uh, and you get uh, basically any columnar read performance that you would get from parquet. Now let's say there's another batch of data that comes in um, that essentially wants to provide uh, 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 upsert some of the entries in uh, the already existing data. Hori maintains an index with which it can route uh, the data into uh, you know where should it be written to, and then in copy on write where we basically rewrite the contents of like a version at C1 uh, to a new version uh, which is attempting to be written at C2, um, so that all the updates are visible. And at this point, since the data is not atomically committed, um, the only contents of version at C1 are visible. And when this, this data is atomically committed, uh, you now are able to see uh, the version at C2. So this worked well uh, for many use cases until it didn't uh, for Uber. And you know some of the cases that uh, it didn't, and uh, 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 this is what I'm going to talk to you about next. So, uh, so what problems did we face? Um, so let's say we have a bunch of uh, you know new and updated trips, a uh, very uh, common use case for Uber. Um, where we have a bunch of incremental updates, and um, you know these updates end up spanning over a bunch of uh, you know these updates and inserts spanning over a bunch of partitions on on the data. Um, so now with copy on write, we'd end up you know rewriting these kinds of files, uh, whichever are affected due to updates, and write new files as inserts. Um, now the average inches time could be about fifteen minutes, where a lot of time is spending is spent on writing you know uh, equ equitable sized parquet files, for example. Um, now, think of uh, another scenario where there are a lot of historical trips being updated for some certain reasons. And then um, you have a bunch of incremental updates that now spans over like you know all sorts of partitions and like uh, thousands and thousands of files. Um, now, that's a ton of I.O. with copy and write, because you end up rewriting all of these files uh, multiple times as these updates are happening. And at the same time, um, you know the job has to do a lot more work, so you really need to scale your job. So depending on you know how you have what kind of resources are at your disposal, this could cause a uh, a serious injection latency. So at this point, uh, if you look up, uh, if you think of the typical data world in the data lake, as I talked about, there are derived data sets that are built on top of your you know raw data sets. Uh, now all of these uh, you know data sets experience the same problem, and this is this ends up being a very cascading effect. So, uh, the, so the, in summary, the problems that we see are, you know, write amplification uh, due to, you know, uh, files getting rewritten, um, higher ingestion latency depending on how you, how, uh, what resources are at your disposal, um, and you know, uh, given the fact that we write uh, parquet files and uh, rewrite parquet files, uh, if you end up writing larger and larger files, your ingestion latency uh, becomes more and more because a lot of time is spent in writing those files. So let's find a solution. So if you think beyond what we have, um, so one of the key problems that we noticed is, okay, how are we handling updates? So instead of uh, you know updating in uh, you know in line, uh, in updating those files in line, how about we up uh, append these updates to a delta file, and uh, you know uh, that uh, appending these updates lowers injection latency directly because we are not spending time rewriting those files. At the same time, since we're not rewriting those files, and if we can uh, you know, keep uh, cross batch data into you know these delta files. We can actually reduce write amplification, um, and at the same time, uh, maybe writing larger files will be feasible, depending on how we route these updates and how we route inserts. So at this point, uh, what we implemented is uh, merge on read, um, and um, uh, at a high level, this is how it works. Um, so you have the same bunch of data, batch of data that's incoming into a Hori managed table. The Timeline says, okay, there is a new data, new data that's then that needs to be written. It writes them into, let's say, your choices. Let's say I want to write in parquet files. Um, so it writes data into parquet files. Uh, the data is committed and is now being able to query. Um, now a bunch of updates come along, and at this point in copy and write, we would have reversioned a uh, file uh, at C1 uh, to another file, but instead here we essentially write this data to an unmerged, uh, you know, delta file. Um, so, and once the commit is done, uh, these uh, this data is available. But um, now you can choose between, you know, like obviously this this helps us achieve, uh, you know, lesser write amplification, higher injection latency. So now there's a trade-off uh, between, okay, you want fresh data, um, and if you do, then you use the real-time queries on Hoodie uh, to actually merge the base data, which is the parquet data, which the delta with the delta data, uh, to serve uh, on-the-fly queries. 
Uh, well, at the same time, if you are very sensitive to, uh, you know, query cost, uh, you continue to uh, have, uh, you know, uh, use read optimized queries, but that comes at a cost of uh, latency. But uh, what if, you know, you wanted uh, both, you wanted, uh, you know, to have read optimized data with fresh data. Uh, so, so this is where we want to bound the query side cost of being able to merge on the fly. Um, so, uh, so as so as we ingest, we want to keep ingesting fast. We don't want to like uh, you know uh, let that go. But uh, can we actually uh, bound this cost? And that's where we introduced asynchronous compactions. Um, so the goal is uh, basically to for merge. So the merge generator speed up ingestion uh, because uh, inline compaction slows it down, while at the same time bound uh, the right side, uh, the re the query side cost. Um, so Hoodie supports lock-free MVCC-based asynchronous compaction to recouple ingestion and compaction while keeping ingestion latency unaffected. So yeah, so this, this, these are all you know details about Hoodie. You know what what we've implemented, what works. Um, so let me talk about finally what are the guarantees that Hoodie provides across all these table types. So Hoodie provides atomic multi-row commits. Um, uh, it is basically uh, supported by a monotonically increasing timestamp to atomically publish new file versions. Um, we only expose valid data uh, to the queries. Any uh, failed or incorrect data is rolled back and not exposed. Uh, it provides snapshot isolation using MVCC. So you can have confident readers, compactors, and you can have the writer, and then uh, you know uh, isolation will be maintained across all of these. And, and finally, uh, we use the commit protocol that we have along with the guarantees of a distributed file system to guarantee, guarantee durability. All right. So, so these are things that you know Hoodie supports right now, and uh, you know in terms of like what set sort of table types you can have for your ingestion use cases. And we we have a bunch of uh, you know use cases at Uber which use other you know out of the box solutions which internally use the you know, these table types. So the so let me talk about some facts and figures about Hoodie at Uber. Um, so uh, at Uber we run about 150 pet plus petabytes transactional data lake, uh, ingesting into uh, more than 10,000 tables. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, writing about 500 billion plus records per day. Um, so we have a hoodie-based data lake. Um, so it's a unified analytical storage. Um, so at Uber, it looks something like this. We have a bunch of upstream database change logs and uh, raw Kafka events, which uh, are pushed both into Kafka. Uh, and then you know our batch ingestion can range anywhere between five minutes to 30 minutes. And all of this data is written into HDFS. And then, uh, because of the you know the, because of the features provided by Hoodie, Hoodie provides uh, you know three different types of queries for you to be able to serve uh, different use cases. So, columnar and read performance queries could be used by you know data science ML or you know other like you know query sensitive uh, you know use cases. Real time queries are you know like provide low latency data in uh, dashboards and maybe ad hoc queries. And incremental queries could be used to build like you know the right DTL data sets and like warehousing. So, uh, so apart from like building out uh, the, uh, this kind of a data lake at, at Uber, there are other use cases at Uber, um, you know, which are supported by out of the box solutions uh, by Hoodie. So, uh, I'll talk about a couple of them. Um, one of them is uh, the Hoodie Delta Streamer. So, Hoodie Delta Streamer is basically a mini ingestion framework uh, implemented in Hoodie to be able to, you know, ingest from different sources uh, uh, to uh, to let's say Hoodie. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Uber's global network team uh, is basically powered in near real time using Hoodie Delta Streamer. Um, the, uh, the high level architecture looks something like this. Um, so we have a bunch of raw, the raw event tables. Um, Hoodie Delta Streamer, you know, incrementally pulls, uh, you know, changes from this raw table. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, for the Uber's network analytics use cases, they transform the entries into you know, delta summaries, again, using transformation uh, functions provided by the delta streamer. And then they essentially uh, upset into a final summary table where they merge, you know, their deltas into a, uh, another delta on the summary table. Uh, and this, uh, you know, this allows the global networks analytics team to actually maintain a, a good history of what's happening in the, uh, in the network, uh, as opposed to storing many raw events. Um, another use case is uh, essentially building ETLs, you know, uh, downstream uh, derived data sets. And Spark data source integration is highly uh, popular there. Um, so with a lot of the uh, folks using, you know, ETLs, you know, they're more proficient in like Hive queries and Python programming. So in that world, uh, you know, Hoodie is used with PySpark uh, on the on Spark data source uh, and looks something like this. So there is a bunch of, uh, you know, Hive queries that incrementally pull from raw data table. 
um, they transform this data and write to, let's say, you know, intermediate staging tables. At this point, they may want to join this intermediate data with other, uh, you know, inter the, uh, other tables uh, to produce a model table. And finally, all the information in the model table can be upserted using three. So these are some of the use cases that uh, you know are are popular at Uber. Uh, we built the uh, Hori Data Lake, and then you know different kinds of out of the box solutions used to uh, support use cases. And uh, so we also use a bunch of advanced primitives uh, that Hori provides, uh, and I'll talk about a few of them. Um, so one of the advanced primitives is how do you recover from uh, data corruption? So some common questions in production systems are you know what if a bug resulted in an incorrect data being pushed to my ingestion system? Or what if an upstream uh, system incorrectly marks some column values as null? Um, so how do you how do you be so this is something that could happen? Um, and how do you basically address these? And Hori does that for you. Uh, Hori has an ability to restore a table to a last known correct time, and it provides two uh, two uh, you know two ways to do this. Uh, one is using save points, uh, which is basically checking checkpoints at different instants of time. Uh, or uh, you know you could basically use the file versions retained, where you could go back as far as in time as needed. Um, so the, the 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 positive benefits of using save points is that uh, it optimizes the number of file versions you need to keep, so reduces the disk space. While uh, this uh, you know the, the the downside is it doesn't work right now for merge and read. Uh, uh, the file versions works for both copy and read and merge and read, but uh, the the downside is it requires extra storage capacity. Um, the other, uh, you know, advanced primitive is incremental pull, uh, which is, uh, you know, very popular for reducing the amount of data that you scan as well as reducing the amount of data that you write in many derived uh, data sets. Um, so there are two ways to, uh, you know, use uh, the incremental ETL. Uh, one of them is using Spark. Um, so you use your Spark data source. Uh, you initialize some of the, you know, some of the uh, all, uh, the, the parameters that you need to do. And uh, you know, the, one of the important uh, things to note is basically you can give a begin instant time. Which is basically, hey, like from what time do I want to incrementally pull all of this data? And then you can have a data set, register that data set as a table if you want to, and then use a Spark SQL to query that data. Uh, we also support that using Hive, uh, and you have to set a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, a Hive connection uh, parameters. And, uh, you know, you, you can, in Hive, you can also provide a bunch of batches that you want to consume from this begin instant time. And then you can go and select, uh, you know, and then you can run a query on that on top of that incremental table. Um, uh, so the other cool feature that you know Buddy provides is the ability to time travel uh, and basically query different snapshots in time. Uh, and you know this like sort of works in conjunction conjunction with incremental pull. Um, so now that you know using Spark, uh, what you can do is uh, you know already define you already define the begin instant time. Uh, what you can do in addition to that is an, uh, is is assign an end instant time. And essentially, in that time range, whatever snapshot you want to query, you can go and query that snapshot. Um, you can do a similar thing using Hive, um, but um, there is a slight caveat to that. There is no such end instant time supported in the Hive path right now. Uh, so you have to convert the end instant time to like num commits to read uh, and then use that. Uh, but we are looking at adding a, a consume end timestamp uh, so that you, know, you have like sort of the same feature parity between Spark and Hive. And this is very. This is a very popular thing used for like you know machine learning feature stores, uh, uh, which uh, which is becoming more and more popular. All right. So now that you know running all of these features at scale, uh, at, at especially at Uber, uh, you know we ran ran into a lot of like you know uh, we did a lot of performance tunings in Spark and Spark applications, and I wanted to share some of the learnings with you. So um, you know, one of the things we realized is you know the, the type of serializer that you use matters a lot. Um, and so we at, at Uber we uh, we use Cryo serializer for all our serialization uh, work, uh, especially in Spark applications. Uh, it, it has a lesser memory footprint uh, than Java serializer, as well as uh, much faster. But the second thing I want to touch upon is uh, shuffle service. Uh, so uh, you know. Uh, so shuffle service is something that's used by Spark, for example, to you know move around data when you are performing shuffles. Um, and so if you have the opportunity to use a resource uh, scheduler or resource manager like Yarn, uh, you know consider using an external shuffle service, ex especially for large memory requirements. It's it's uh, the reliability of shuffle service is challenging, and it contributes directly to job stability. And you know doing this helped us in like initially in you know how to like manage you know how Spark applications are. Reading uh, large amounts of data. Uh, 
Um, the third thing I want to touch upon is uh, Spark's memory model. Um, so understanding how to effectively use heap versus non-heap uh, is extremely important. Uh, and as, as well as, you know, how do you tune, uh, you know, the heap memory that you use, which uh, basically could be as naive as the executive memory that you have, how do you tune that? Because uh, we've noticed that a lot of times, you know, people uh, run Spark applications where uh, there is lack of understanding of whether their their the throughput of the job is uh, high given the resources that that the job has been provided. So, so Uber did implement an open source profiler to be able to profile your Spark jobs and to see if you're actually using the memory that you know you're you're giving to your Spark job. And lastly, uh, you know, bad configurations can make or break the day. So, in, investing in config tuning constantly is is extremely important. Um, and if you have an automated feedback mechanism to tune that, uh, um, parts of something that we have at Uber is extremely valuable. Um, and as you run like larger jobs, you choose between different table types. Uh, tuning hoodie configs uh, is also, uh, you know, like uh, extremely important because uh, as you're uh, based on use cases, uh, different configs can give you a different set of performances. All right. Um, so that's that's what we have, you know, up until now. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you about what's coming soon and the and what's in the roadmap for you next. Uh, so uh, we have a, a release 0 0.6.0 0 that's coming up um, in the next couple of months, uh, and there are two super cool features uh, that are that are being worked on. Um, so one is, you know, we've had a lot of uh, you know chatter around how do you convert an existing canonical hive table uh, to a hoodie table. Uh, essentially, the people want to migrate their canonical tables to hoodie tables to you know support upsearch, do incremental pulls, and we want an efficient way to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll encourage you to read the full RFC, which also has you know examples and like uh, you know scale numbers on how how fast and how efficient this is. But like to give you a very quick uh, you know tidbit of how it works, essentially uh, you know you you use a data frame to trigger an action on the table. And all you tell the, uh, the uh, action is that the operation uh, type is a bootstrap operation. Uh, and then Hoodie will basically go ahead in the background and do that for you. Um, and the second very cool feature is, uh, you know, Hoodie has invested a lot in, you know, how do you optimize writes? How do you ingest data? How do you manage, you know, latency uh, write amplification? Uh, we have so much of metadata that we can actually improve queries uh, drastically. Um, so there is a RFC that's like uh, that's an implementation right now, uh, which is to provide order of query, one query planning. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, as your table size grows, instead of letting Hive and like you know to to do this query planning for you by scanning like different partitions, Hoodie can do this in constant time uh, uh, with the metadata that's already available. Um, we also want to eliminate file listing, um, something that you know many uh, cloud stores and HDFS do not like. Um, and this is uh, the the PR is already out. Um, uh, the, the RFC has more details around it. Uh, finally, um, you know, uh, given that we have all of this information and this metadata, uh, you know, we want to expose some column column indexes on Hori datasets, which can allow you to uh, you know uh, perform where clauses, so as to say, uh, on you know non partition columns in Hive or in Presto or in Spark. Um, so that's that. Those are the uh, upcoming features, uh, and you know the, some of the uh, notable items um, that we have in the roadmap uh, are as follows. Um, so you know, Hori provides different uh, types of pluggable indexing mechanisms, um, and we're working working on one which will basically provide blazing fast upsets uh, for you know all large workloads where you know a large number of data might be, be might, might have been upsorted. Um, we're working on uh, a couple of other things uh, around, you know, data clustering. On, uh, you know, we we already do storage management of, you know, how do you size files? How do you make sure, uh, you know, you write equitable like size files? But at the same time, we also want to see, okay, how if if based on like applications, how does this should this data be clustered? Sort of like decouple, uh, you know, how do you ingest data from how do you actually lay out this data? Uh, you know, based on like application uh, requirements. Um, there is a PR out for real-time queries on Presto, and in the longer term, there is a, a lot of ask in the community uh, to have uh, in, to integrate Flink with Hoodie, and there is some initial work that started on that. Um, with this, that's all I had. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, uh, Apache, as I mentioned, Apache recently uh, Hoodie recently graduated to a top-level project. We have a very exciting and ambitious roadmap. Uh, and a very budding and welcoming community. So if you're interested, please uh, you know, connect with us at dev.apache.org.
follow us on Twitter, or if you're interested in trying out Hoodie, uh, please go to hoodie.apache.org. Uh, there is a very cool uh, Docker, uh, you know, quick start that you can actually, you know, use to start start like you're using and analyzing your use case in a matter of minutes. Um, all right. Um, at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions. And we have one question from Nicola, uh, who's telling us uh, that he's already tried Hive with Hoodie and can't wait uh, for time travel there too. Uh, his question, his first question is about Spark. Can you make an example of external shuffle service? Um, uh, can I make an example of external shuffle service? So, um, I, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by external shuffle service. So, uh, you know, whenever you shuffle between, uh, you know, when a Spark job starts and you want to shuffle data, uh, you know, there are the, the there will be some sort of a server that runs which reads data from the local disk that you've like spilled to, and then provides it from one mapper to a reducer, so as to say. Um, and so, uh, you know, you could either use the uh, stuff that's provided by Spark standalone, or you could have a resource manager do that for you. And uh, you know, depending on you know what kind of memory requirements you have, and you know what reliability you want, you you may want to choose one bit, one or the other. And for us, you know, we uh, external shuffle service on Yarn work. We have some more work uh, which we did on on top of that, which is not part of this talk, but that's something that worked for us. Okay. Um, then how do you plan to get rid of file listing? Yeah, so I think uh, you know that if you go and read the RFC, uh, the, the RFC number is RFC fifteen. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, we already have all of this metadata since Hodi is the writer to these tables. We already have all of the metadata. Um, uh, so if you look at the dot Hodi folder, all these uh, command files already have the metadata. So the idea is to basically consolidate that metadata and be able to read uh, entries from that metadata as opposed to uh, you know asking. Uh, Hive, Metastore, and then going to HDFS to figure out which files are present on disk. OK. Uh, have you evaluated other file formats like ORC or Carbon Data? Um, yeah, I think uh, there is a PR on ORC. Um, I think uh, there is some back and forth on that. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so I'll talk about it in two, two aspects. One is, well, how will Hoodie support these file formats? So there is a push to support ORC. At Uber, we had uh, you know ORC and Parquet initially. We had both, and then we moved to Parquet for you know some of the community uh, work that's been done, uh, some sort of like uh, encodings that were not available. Um, I think at this point, uh, it may be worthwhile to like reevaluate ORC Parquet because a lot of work has been done, uh, and Hoodie is uh, will eventually support both. Okay, cool. Uh, that's all for the questions. I think the breakout room uh, will stay open uh, for. <laughs> for all the night if you want to, to continue discussion with Nicola, who is uh, following the talk uh, actively. I think he's typing, maybe he's, a, he's got another question. No, it was a thanks from him. All right, all right. Uh, so I think you can, yeah, you can continue discussion freely on the breakout room. And uh, this was the last session of the day, I think on Vibas 2 at least. So thank you a lot for this, this, uh, this talk. Uh, I didn't really know about the subject, but learned a lot. And it was clear for me. So thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess it was for the others, too. Thank you, Nishit. And have a great end of day. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Ayn, for moderating. Thank you for all your patience.